if it's a choice between going for glory and trying to get that last photo versus making the team any safer, I know that I'll make the right decision. If you'd asked me at age 12, you know, what would you like to do? Uh, I would have said big mountains, snowy spaces, long journeys. Now we might have to think about a plan B. I think for me it's going to be about capturing the landscape with my camera and being able to take shots of both stills and video of an extraordinary landscape. The real storm has kicked in. Tent's gone, the expedition is over. Beyond coming back alive and being friends, to complete the A to B route, the B retracing, the first ever crossing of Svalbard, uh, is, is something that really appeals to me to, to go in their footsteps. This epic journey to Svalbard had its origin, like so many epic journeys before it, among the dreaming spires of Oxford. A group of us went to a lecture on a series of expeditions that Oxford undertook to the island of Spitsbergen in the 1920s, and we saw a series of really amazing photos. These amazing photographs are from a pioneering expedition to Svalbard, then known as Spitsbergen, in the high Arctic in 1923. James and his university friends realised that no one had returned since to record photographically nearly a century of change. So we thought it would be a fantastic project uh, to go back and retrace the footsteps of this 1923 expedition, of which people like Sandy Irvin was part, and I've long admired Sandy Irvin for the amazing accomplishments he achieved in uh, his short life. The plan all the more compelling as the explorer Sandy Irvin had also attended Merton College, Oxford. Svalbard used to be known as Spitsbergen, which means jagged mountains. It's the historical name of the Norwegian archipelago and is home to the world's most northerly settlement. Not to mention more than 2,000 glaciers, a breathtaking but dangerous landscape where the Arctic weather can become hazardous in a matter of hours. It will take at least 30 days to retrace the pioneering 1923 expedition route from Doom Point over hostile and challenging terrain before returning to the fjords of Billen Bay. What the 23 expedition achieved was the first crossing of Spitsbergen by a British crew and they were literally walking off the map and that was very thrilling and dangerous. Hundreds of hours of meticulous planning were carried out for what seemed like an insurmountable challenge. For the four undergraduates of today, it's the trip of a lifetime. James Lamb started climbing at the age of 15 and went on to become president of the Oxford University Mountaineering Club, as well as a member of the prestigious Alpine Club and a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. James is expedition leader. Jamie Gardner, an experienced climber, wrote his university thesis on early 20th century Arctic exploration. He therefore focused on the history of the 23 expedition, notably the original photographs and the precise coordinates where they were taken, so they could be faithfully repeated. Jamie is expedition historian and film director. Will Hartz was tasked with teaching the team to ski, having completed several Nordic and Alpine ski tours. His travels have taken him from the deserts of the Wahiba Sands to the heights of the Mont Blanc Massif. He's also been president of the Oxford University Exploration Club. Because breathing is too mainstream. Will is expedition medical officer. Liam Garrison has a love of all things outdoors. In 2014, he completed a 3,700 kilometer cycle tour down the Pacific coast of the US, documenting the journey with his camera. Liam is expedition photographer and filmmaker. The four undergraduates would be following in the larger than life footsteps of Andrew Sandy Irvin, Jeffrey Milling, Noel O'Dell, and Robert Fraser. At Merton College Library, James meets Julie Summers, the great niece of Sandy Irvin, 
to learn more about the man and the 1923 team. A wealth of documents and artefacts chart the story of Spitsbergen 1923. The photographs they intend to replicate, as well as a treasure trove of letters and appeals for funding. It's really difficult to retake. Yeah, these are all 23 pictures. Oh, are they? So okay, that's, that's interesting. So here's that's a different picture. angle. Yeah. I love this, this picture of all the oxes. Among them, a letter from Oxo offering stock cubes for the journey and other donations from private individuals. Oh, look. So there we are. They've got donations towards the expedition. Five pounds. Mm. What would that have been worth in 23? 40 to 60, about 120 quid. That's not, not too bad. bad. donation, isn't no, it? No, quite. Well, I think what was interesting about the 23 expedition was there were two different age groups. There was Noel O'Dell and R.A. Fraser, who were in their 30s, and then Sandy and Jeff Milling, who were 20. But what O'Dell recognised in both Sandy and Geoffrey Milling was a maturity beyond their years and this ability to shut out all discomfort and simply get on with the job. Sandy Irvin was also a prodigious rower. He helped Oxford to victory in the 1923 Oxford and Cambridge boat race. He was one of those useful men to have in a boat who didn't seem to feel the pain of pushing beyond the wall, as the rowers call it. And he regarded his rowing as almost as a religion. He was absolutely passionate about it. And he brought that passion from his rowing into his exploration and expeditions. In 1924, Irvin was selected to join George Mallory in an attempt to become the first to scale Everest. They were last seen by Noel O'Dell disappearing into the clouds near the summit. Well, the big unanswered question is, did Sandy Irvin and George Mallory reach the summit of Mount Everest on the 10th of June, 1924? I don't think I'll ever know the answer to that. And you know, I don't think it really matters because they climbed higher than any man on the planet in 1924. To this day, the mystery remains unsolved. While Mallory's body was found in 1999, Irvin's remains are yet to be discovered. And perhaps more critically, his camera, which may contain the vital evidence, also remains hidden somewhere near the summit. Part of our training for pulling massive sledges, we go to the Port Meadow, which is a place in Oxford that's sort of normally for picnics and nice walks. Except that we tend to ruin it every Sunday by uh, charging past everyone with these probably three, four by four tyres tied to our uh, dragging harnesses uh, and sweating profusely, and we get so many weird looks. But it is really good training. Just how physically demanding it is pulling an 80, 90 kilo polk. Um, we, we experienced that on our training expedition in Norway. In Norway, the training moved up a gear, testing the team's physical endurance to the limits. These were the sorts of conditions they could expect in Svalbard. Freezing temperatures, icy terrain and strong winds. Nothing is left to chance not least because the team will be travelling across a hostile wilderness without any support. If something goes wrong, they would be in serious trouble. Good. The team are also finalising clear expedition objectives to retrace the route of the 1923 expedition, being the first team to follow in their footsteps across the island while repeating their panoramic photos of the landscape, a process known as re-photography. To conduct scientific research in the region, the team will use a drone to create ultra-high resolution maps of the glaciers. To climb a number of Spitsbergen's alpine mountains, not only repeating climbs done by the 23 expedition, but also establishing their own new routes. These are amazing photos of the mountaineering. As a final part of the team's preparations, they must learn how to deal with the dangers posed by the large population of polar bears in Svalbard, especially in the coastal areas.
The team enlist the help of Endrifa Jermansen as their fifth member. His wealth of expertise in Arctic safety is invaluable, though he's at pains to stress the use of a range of scare tactics if confronted by a bear, and that firearms are a last resort. I don't really like cows, so um, I don't know why I'm going to Svalbard where there's 3,000 polar bears. <laughs> July 28, 2016, and there's no turning back. For Will, who admits to being prone to seasickness, the news is not so good. The weather's not sounding uh, as far as good as we hoped, so we're going to have to wait and see. Well, it's good for you, isn't it? Because you love the sea. <laughs> I love the sea. Yeah, I've done it, mate. The team face a long and bumpy boat journey from Long Year Bend to the expedition landing site on the northeast of the island, a journey of just over 400 kilometres. Now we're ready to go. Pretty choppy out here. Conditions go from bad to worse. The seas are too rough. So we're trying to think of another solution because if these guys have to turn around. The chances of making it to their planned destination look increasingly slim. Will and James are suffering in the huge stomach churning seas. The skipper pushes on. After 20 hours in treacherous conditions, the team are forced to abandon hopes of reaching the original landing site and instead aim for a point some three kilometers farther down the coast. Day two doesn't quite go according to plan. It's now a huge challenge simply disembarking by dinghy after landing at the wrong site. Marooned, exhausted, but nevertheless delighted to have reached the start of their adventure. I can't believe we've finally done it, we're here. Pittsburgh Express, Pittsburgh Express, this is James, come in over. Yep, no problem, have a nice trip. Thank you very much, uh, James out. We're all alone now. Another consequence of not reaching the original landing site was having to drag their heavy pulks, each weighing in at more than 80 kilograms, to the first campsite, desperately in need of sleep. Even Brees, the only expedition husky on the trip, is relieved after suffering the ill effects of the boat journey. He's actually a cross between a German shepherd and an Alaskan husky especially important as a faithful guard on polar bear watches. In this cold and isolated wilderness, the team find it hard going. There are meltwater streams everywhere. Much has clearly changed since the 23 expedition. There's way more sea here we can see than in there. Send a bit more in there. It seems almost impossible to line up each part of the photo to what we're seeing on the ground. Having fully rested, the first mission is to try to retake this photograph at Doom Point, taken by Robert Fraser. But finding the exact spot nearly a century later won't be easy. The glacier has retreated a huge amount since this photo was taken. The idea was to, to go and find the original point of that photo where it was taken, where Robert Fraser set up his tripod 93 years ago and literally take the exact same photo and it did take us a while we nearly gave up at one point the last ditch attempt I, I, I ran up to the summit and tried to find it and I just like held the photo up next to me and uh, looked at it and it was exactly the same it was really cool after hours of searching Liam finally manages to recreate Fraser's photograph revealing a huge reduction in the extent of the ice cap now they realize that their intended landing site would no longer have given them easy access onto the ice the plan is to try to repeat more than 20 of the original expedition photographs. Next, it's time to get the drone in the air. Using the drone will give the team a chance to record imagery of Spitsbergen the 23 expedition could only have dreamed of. 
In the weeks ahead, the drone will play a vital role in mapping the glaciers. For now, the results are quite simply breathtaking. Coming around the corner off the moraine, seeing all this ice just everywhere, it was just ridiculous. And uh, the, one of the best things is you can't actually see here is there's a big sort of sinkhole. So there's this big lake behind us and the river that drains out to the sea kind of runs this way. And there's a big gorge and there's a massive hole and it's probably like 20 or 30 meters down to the, uh, to the water. And it looks really cool. At one point, we must have just come over a rise and suddenly the view behind me opened up and the sun had just come out. And I've seen ice caps before in Greenland and I've seen glaciers in the Alps. But there was something about this one, I think perhaps because, because of the sense of the fact that the water has dropped, it's left these spectacular just chunks of ice just kind of marooned. And the diminished water level makes them stand out even more. Actually, looking back to the 23 expedition is quite a good guide. So some of the pictures that were taken from around here were taken a few days later. So we still have, it's only not behind schedule. I think something which must have made the, the landscape particularly special in the 1920s was the fact that these men were coming to it you know, for the first time. They were coming to a landscape which not only they had never been to, but was not even mapped. They had no idea what was over the horizon. You know, we knew there was going to be a lake here. We didn't know it was going to be quite as stunning and as choked with ice sculptures as it is. If we were here when, when the water level uh, was really high, it would have been a, a great danger. Why is it that they didn't land where we landed? And why is it that they didn't talk about this in great detail? Because this is crazy, this is absolutely phenomenal. I think the novelty of carrying all your crap across this sort of tricky landscape, it'll definitely wear off at some point. But I do have my expedition surprise for I think day 22 or something like that for the uh, team, so hopefully that should perk us up. The team now head away from the coast across the Loven Plateau. Fortunately, the snow is firm and the weather good, a far cry from the terrible storms which blighted the 23 team. They took four days to complete this leg of the journey, against just eight hours for their successors to reach camp a few kilometres from Bear Bay Glacier. Even with today's modern equipment, setting up camp requires great attention to detail if the team are to stay the course. Conditions in Svalbard can change dramatically at short notice, so everything has to be secure and protected. 
as this will be base camp for a number of days to allow the team to explore the surrounding area, a little comfort can go a long way. Well, we're here for a few days now, so there's no reason not to make it a little, a little bit of luxury. No luxury for Brees, whose husky coat is able to withstand temperatures down to minus 50 degrees Celsius. Really looking forward to this guy, the trusty chicken tikka with rice. Ensuring the team are well fed and expedition fit means carrying a vast array of essential kit and first aid. A salmon and pesto pasta. Half the weight they must carry in their pulks accounts for a little over 40 kilograms of rations each. Mostly freeze-dried food and snacks, enough to provide some 5,000 calories a day per person. Interesting note on this trail mix. When we first started, I thought it tasted absolutely disgusting. And now it tastes amazing. The spectacle of Jamie stripping off in biting cold temperatures may seem bizarre, even foolhardy. But his sacrifice is all in a good cause. The reef photography at its finest, Jamie. Sandy Irvin thought for some daft reason that here was a good place to get half naked. I can tell you there are several reasons why it's not a good place to get half naked. One is it's bloody freezing. The other is... This rock is so sharp. <laughs> and, and the third reason is, not only is the rock sharp, making it very hard to stand, if you fall over, you fall down that thing. This is the somewhat most iconic picture of, of the trip, where Sandy is seen standing naked with this beautiful backdrop. Well, that's great. Oh, wow, it actually looks quite real, that does. And this is the real photograph of Sandy Irvin minus his attire. Perfect. Now, Liam. Yeah. All Liam has to do is replicate the shot. Yeah. Alongside each other, these iconic expedition pictures are as good as identical. Mission accomplished. Just a matter of metres away, the team stumble across the remnants of one of the 1923 camps, which had lain undiscovered for nearly a century. A lot of food, a lot of tins. It's been hungry. Oxo. But it's definitely it's definitely oxo. That's incredible. Is oxo literally just like a beef cube? It's like yeah. a it's like a beef stock. Old tins, clothing, and wooden tent pegs so, uh, preserved in the dry Arctic yeah. conditions. Sound of the 1920s, that is. But has Jamie spotted an opportunity? I'm guessing they got it for free from the Oxo company. So if anyone from Oxo Roxo's marketing division is out there. We have some great footage, which uh, <laughs> we'd be prepared to uh, it comes to an agreeable price over. Visibility is starting to diminish, but spirits remain high. You can basically go to uh, Ponkeray Top and, and climb it tomorrow. Oh. Day 10 and the team are discussing their next mountaineering challenges. But James is also concerned that their use of the drone isn't yet fulfilling their scientific objectives. What we're doing with the mapping is essentially just taking loads of pictures from the drone. But in order to make the maps more accurate, more precise, what you need to do is have points on the ground which you know the location of definitely. Jamie Tool Station's arrested requesting radio check. Come in please, over. The team set out on a mission to conduct more accurate drone mapping. As they strive to reach their target destination with a few tumbles on the way, oh. Jamie identifies the first of a series of serious obstacles they'll face in the coming days. Yeah, we've got this uh, meltwater stream right in the middle of the transect. GPS requires us to go straight over there. We could conceivably start from here but we will need to go further down in a minute. Uh, and the weather's sort of closing in at the moment. I think there are parts where you could step across with your crampons. If we can bridge it, I mean, for example, there's a constriction there. I think you want poles, actually, so you can uh, plant them. This fast-running icy meltwater poses a risky challenge. There's no option but to cross to the other side.
He got me. Aye. Jamie, I'll pass you the rope. For hours on end, the team worked tirelessly, crisscrossing the icy and sometimes hazardous landscape to a range of locations which could be used as mapping control points for the drone. Oh, Go back, go back, go back. Reverse. Reverse. <laughs> uh, yeah, it would seem we have arrived at the fabled snow swamp. Back up the ice screw anchor. Which... The team rope up as an added security measure while negotiating the many crevasses on the glacier. You got it? The ingenious use of local rocks is a game changer. Okay, so now we've got a cross on the ground, which the drone should be able to see when we make the map. Uh, I'm just going to take the GPS of the centre of the cross, such that we can make the map more accurate. You good? I'm just registering the control points. What? It needs to be stationary. Seventy nine degrees point two three four nine three. By taking a series of aerial images which pinpoint the makeshift location markers, in conjunction with the precise GPS coordinates for each, it's possible to generate a more accurate map of the area. These are then processed into three D digital elevation models using powerful software. With up to 100 times the resolution of satellite mapping, the final results are an unparalleled level of detail of Bear Bay Glacier. We can see the cavernous crevasses, dynamic rivers of ice, wafer-thin snow bridges and gushing meltwater channels, an extraordinary snapshot of an ever-changing Arctic landscape. The team face freezing fog and almost whiteout conditions as they head to their next destination at the base of Poincaré Toppen, also known as Mount Deception by the 23 expedition because they were unsure of its name. Over the coming days, remaining focused is vital to avoid getting lost. When the weather closes in, it's time to take cover. As always, with a mix of resignation and humour, snowy and white and miserable outside so we decided to put the Greek shelter up. I thought it was absolutely fine outside personally. The yeah. exits are here, here and here. The icy conditions are playing havoc with both kit and clothing. Very carefully removed. So we've just arrived uh, here at so-called Fox Camp or what it, how it was known to the original, uh, original bunch. They called it Fox Camp because famously uh, Sandy Irvin got his rifle out and shot an Arctic fox, which uh, he and Jeffrey Milling proceeded to skin and I don't know if they all ate, ate it, but some of them ate it. Here seems the ideal spot for an important milestone, the long-standing yeah. explorer's tradition of flying the flag for sponsors uh, and country. It was uh, a massive long slog through the fog all day today. This is we come to camp. The sun comes out and we're feeling good. There you go. The mountain now provides an even greater reward. It's now that the 2016 team witnessed the majesty of the icy wilderness ahead that they planned to see for so long. Their reward, spectacular views from Quankari Toppen of the Atomfiela Mountains. From here, they could scour the horizon and see for the first time their expedition destinations ahead of them. From the summit, we had uh, brilliant sunshine. View, our first proper views of the Atom Fjellar. 79 degrees and 6 minutes north, 17 degrees 3 minutes east 
lies one of the key mountaineering objectives that the team have been looking forward to. Irvin Fjellet, or Mount Irvin, whose spectacular ridge was first climbed by Nola Dell and Sandy Irvin in 1923. Now about to attempt the same route, the 2016 team. The rock looks pretty good. Not quite clear what the route was. I've tried and tested well. They said it was tricky in places. Alpine Legends heading off. Here we go, right? Later. Good luck, guys. See you in a few hours. While Liam and Will remain behind to focus on the aerial filming of the climb, James, Jamie and Endra make the second oh, ascent wow. of the ridge, summiting within a limited weather window. For the entire ascent, calm weather and blue skies prove ideal conditions. Sandy Irvin said in his diary that they reached the summit at 0125, August 17, 1923, and described the view from the top as being absolutely stupendous. Odell had also described the spectacular scenery, as fine as any amongst the highest Alps. For the steeper sections, the team decide to rope up, with the summit at around 1,500 metres now in striking distance. And I'll flake it out from this end. It takes the team about six hours to climb the route. It's a special milestone in the 2016 expedition, the first team to complete this climb since their Oxford counterparts 93 years earlier. The weather's now closing in somewhat, but we uh, made it to the summit just in time. There's a few sections of slightly dodgy rock, we had to, and we roped up uh, a little bit in the middle. Um, but overall, I think that was absolutely spectacular. I'd say it's probably the best Alpine route I've ever done. We're wondering whether or not this was the original cairn that Odell and Irvin talk about um, erecting when they got to the top. The team must now prepare for what's to come. The forecast is grim. Day 17 and the expedition takes a turn for the worse. A howling storm engulfs the campsite. The team have no choice but to hunker down. We're all totally locked to the ground here. Pinned here on Galabrine, just below Mount Irvin. The storm force gales now threaten plans to repeat a key photograph at the top of Mount Irvin taken by Odell. There's Mount Irvin behind me. Looks uh, pretty snowy. I'm not sure how me and Liam are going to get up there. Probably not is the answer to that. Poor Breeze here, stuffing out the cold weather. Oh, poor dog. All right then. Uh, I see the camp is absolutely coated in snow. Another concern is the impact on equipment. These solar panels are vital for charging batteries for computers, cameras and the drone. Thankfully, the tents are holding up to the storm. Finally poured some water for breakfast. Just having some uh, delicious looking scrambled egg with potato and pepper. Uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, tent pegs has pulled out, so the, uh, the tent is beginning to collapse on me. 18 hours of Arctic blizzards have taken their toll with equipment buried under a metre of snow. So uh, I'm digging out my pole. Uh, hopefully I'm going to find my skis under here somewhere. Time for some more climbing. A bit of exploratory mountaineering, following in the uh, spirit of the 1923 expedition. I've been uh, camp bound for the last day or so. Uh, so I think everyone's getting a bit claustrophobic, so 
be nice to uh, make a bit of progress into uncharted territory. So we've decided to go up the ridge and uh, we are currently racking up. It's about 5 p.m. and uh, feeling pretty good about it. Sometimes it's worth stopping simply to soak in the experience of being an explorer. This place is sick. Literally no one else here. After a day of skiing, Jamie, James and Liam decide to climb a rocky ridge, Vesterfjord. Hey team, my knees get cold. This is proving quite a tricky ascent. Ooh. With cloud closing in, time running out, and yet more difficult rock, the decision is made to abandon the rest of the climb. Oh. The team are now on the move again, keen to take advantage of exceptional weather in the knowledge that what lies ahead could jeopardise the remaining days of the expedition. 93 years to the day, Will and James make their way to the top of a peak called La Flastoppen, known to the 23 team as Mount Hope, with the intention of repeating some eye-catching photographs. This, the original by Robert Fraser, now faithfully repeated by Will, a stunning replication of the landscape of Spitsbergen. The team have now got to grips with building snowy fortresses to protect their tents from the brunt of yet more strong winds. They dedicate their time to planning which photographs they can hope to reproduce, as well as their next expedition milestone. We've got about, we've got about 16. So I guess the thing is, if we, if we camp at the base of the citadel, then we have three days, so we move tomorrow and then we have two days there. Yeah. One of which could be Galileo, could be Galileo the other could be Newton. Or if it's bad weather on one of those days, then you can just do Newton top. And also it probably means that the journey to Chernichev might not necessarily take a whole day either. The team ski to the Citadel, described by Sandy Irvin as huge granite slabs rising absolutely perpendicular to a height of more than 100 metres. Pretty scary just looking at it. Yeah. If you've got any kind of imagination, it's pretty terrifying. Yeah, it really draws you in. So we're going to camp here tonight and uh, see what's what on the face. bit windy so we decided to put up the group shelter while the others go and look for a campsite. I'm being <laughs> by the Arctic. James, Jamie, Will, Liam and Endra now find themselves in the eye of a storm they describe as biblical in strength. They battle to try to build a shelter. Conditions are worsening almost by the minute, with biting cold winds hitting speeds up to 100 kilometers an hour. It's the lowest moment of the expedition. Will fears the worst. Tent's gone, the expedition is over. Yeah, let's not f tent, let's get in the group shelter. We built our shelter, uh, which is now melting. 
After failing to put up their tents for fear of them being damaged, even destroyed, the only option is to erect the survival shelter. Eleven thirty at night, and it looks like we're not going to be able to um, put the tent up. So it looks like we're staying here for the night, unless we can dig down and make a shelter. Huddled together for nine hours. For the next two days, the weather is again the dominating force. It's as much as the team can do to remain rested and nourished and to try to stay warm. I've had a situation where I've just gone from just like a pulp full of dry kit through to everything being soaked. I haven't got any, I haven't got any spares. Liam, James and Jamie are all suffering the effects of extreme cold to their toes. At least now, they have managed to put up a tent. Anyway, we're about to sit down and watch a, a film about drug dealing uh, in the comfort of our nice warm tent. It's a far cry from 48 hours ago. Newton Toppen, the highest mountain in Svalbard, is the next eagerly awaited challenge. At just over 1,700 metres in the northeast of the island, Newton Toppen was named in the late 19th century after the scientist Sir Isaac Newton. We are all heading off to Newton Toppen, which is Svalbard's highest mountain by one metre. A three man team comprising James, Jamie, and Endra decide to attempt a new unclimbed route on a striking granite ridge on the west of the mountain, very much in the spirit of exploration of the 23 team. Lovely rosy pink granite above us, which certainly looks more solid than any rock we've seen so far. As they reach the top via the west ridge, all around are breathtaking views of Svalbard. So we've uh, just finished climbing the uh, west ridge on uh, Newton Toppen. We believe it's the first ascent of the ridge. So uh, I think there's going to be a bit of discussion as to what to name the, uh, the route. The route will now and forever be known as Gardner Regan, or the Gardner Ridge. The wind may have picked up, but James and Jamie have one final task before their descent. Liam and Will have the job of recreating photographs from the 23 expedition after skiing up a different route. Here we are on Markov Toppen, which is uh, an outer line peak from uh, the real deal um, Toppen behind me. And we're just uh, squaring away some reef photography here, particularly uh, the view looking towards Newton Toppen and the Asenfjella. The reef photography is probably the most rewarding thing finding the original spot of a photograph that was taken nearly a century ago, standing in the exact same place that they were, it gives you that sort of connection back to the original trip. Back at base camp, there's a highly anticipated and memorable and, uh, moment. Liam has just unveiled his long-awaited exposition surprise with which he is going to instantaneously lift the mood of the group. What have you got for us, Liam? I've got mandarin segments in juice Ooh, yeah. from Tesco. And um, we've all just, we'll just opened it up. We've been greeted with a lovely coating of sort of chopped up bits of orange. Slightly icy. Slightly icy, but it hasn't frozen and exploded the tin, which is good. And I've just been sniffing it. It smells super zesty. And uh, none of us have had fruit or veg fresh 
for 25 days now, so it's going to be really, really nice to have some fresh fruit. Bite into the fresh fruit and drink the juice from this can to the East Pittsburgh ice cap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> Javili, as the Albanians say. Has it got a good nose? That's meant full-bodied. That's meant for really good. Sweet and yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Melting your mouth. <laughs> Day 26 and the team make an ascent of Chernyshev Yelet to reach a Russian beacon where they plan to recreate an iconic photograph originally featuring Odell, Milling and Irvin, taken by Fraser. The 2016 version features James, Jamie and Will, taken by Liam, one for the scrapbook. Okay, open it. Astonishingly, just a matter of metres away, the team find a small, well-preserved canister, originally left by Russians in 1901. Inside, a time capsule of artefacts oh, from different expeditions. Monarchy. One in particular proves very special. <laughs> Hold that. This is too good to be true. What does it say? Visited by the Topographical Party, Merton College, Oxford, Arctic Expedition, 1923. The signatures on the note are as clear as the day they were written, signed by Odell, Fraser, Irvin and Milling. The team take it in turn to add their names to a piece of history for future explorers. The expedition is nearing its end with Billum Bay now in sight, but there's no time to rest. The team head for the Nordenskjold Glacier, where they have a race against the clock to retake one final but vital photograph from the top of Mount Robert. For about 12 hours to try and get this really spectacular photograph, which will hopefully uh, give us a very indication, good indication of how the, um, the glaciers may or may not be changing. Uh, but in order to let uh, let us get that photo, we had to send half the team off to climb the mountain, which means that uh, the other half of us, myself, Liam and Will, are left to uh, move the polks through um, the last stage of the Northern Gold Glacier. And this glacier is uh, by far the most uh, crevassed and meltwater ribbon that we've seen so far. This glacier is probably the biggest uh, single glacier we've been on so far. It's a couple of kilometers across and poses some pretty uh, serious challenges. Three, two, one, go. Me, uh, Will and Jamie were tasked with moving five pulks down this uh, horrendously hummocky dry glacier, uh, while Endra and James went off to Mount Robert to uh, repeat a photograph that was taken in 1921 by an Oxford University expedition uh, that came to these parts. We'd sort of divided and conquered, and it was really, really satisfying because we managed to achieve our reef photography goal. That goal was to show the huge extent to which the glacier had retreated in nearly a century of shrinking ice, in some places by more than three kilometers. Who knows by how much in another century? After 32 days on the ice, the team have now reached the end of their journey. These intrepid explorers have written their small part in the history books, and there is now time for reflection on what this expedition has meant to them and how they have been changed by their epic retracing of Spitsbergen, 1923. The biggest success has really been just completing a successful crossing. When you think of the Arctic, maybe you think of huge expanses as sort of bare, barren ice cap. And Svalbard's not at all like that. Svalbard is full of very different, very glaciated, different landscapes. 
we encountered some pretty horrendous weather. And I think because of the training we'd done, we uh, certainly stacked the odds in our favor. Think back and uh, what will you remember most? And of course that storm we had, that's something that you know, the highlight in that sense. I'll remember most of the trip for quite a while, I think. I think the biggest thing for me was that we managed to get across the ice caps successfully, safely, and remained friends. We've succeeded on actually all fronts. So we had science going on, we had mountaineering, we had a film to make. This is the somewhat most iconic picture of, of the trip. The roof photography was absolutely great and we absolutely smashed that I thought with 20, 30 photographs. There were times when it got fairly serious out there and it was pretty, if not dangerous, it was pretty uncomfortable. And there were times when I was really having to go to my happy place during the storm. So the strength of the roof photography lies more in going to understand what the hardships and what the nature of undertaking this expedition 93 years ago was. And it must have just been so much worse without the, without the proper equipment that we had back in 1923. And I think it says, it says it speaks volumes about the, the men who went on that expedition. The importance of sort of retracing is that you put yourself in someone else's footsteps and you can connect with a group of people that were here quite a long time ago. It is a large weight off my shoulders now that we're, we're all home safe. I'll miss it. <laughs>